Hi listeners, stories have so much power and so does whoever controls the narrative. It is time that we dissect and analyze these stories. I am Vipul and this is Vogue Tales. Hi everyone, this week's episode comes before Juneteenth and I bring you a story of an 8-year-old girl, Ida Adkin. This is a real story narrated by her when she was 79 years old. In Slave Narrative, a folk history of slavery in the United States, from interviews with former slaves, prepared by the Federal Writers Project, 1936-1938. But before I narrate the story, I want to welcome today's guests, Kristen is a law student and is from North Carolina, where this story is based. And Josh is a behavioral therapist and was raised in Texas, where Juneteenth started. Hi, Kristen, and hi, Josh. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having us. Hello, hello. Later in the episode, I will give you a brief history of Juneteenth, but for now, it is story time. Ida Atkin, ex-slave, 79 years old. I was born before the war. I was about eight years old when the Yankee men came through. My mammy and pappy, Hattie and Jim Jeffries, belonged to Mars Frank Jeffries. Mars Frank comes from Mississippi, but when I was born, he and Miss Mary Jane were living down near Louisburg in North Carolina, where they had a big plantation and I don't know how many slaves. Mars Frank was good to his slaves, except that he never gave them enough to eat. He worked them hard on half rations, but he didn't believe in all the time beating and selling them. My pappy worked at the stables. He was a good horseman, but my mammy worked at Big House helping Miss Mary Jane. Mammy worked in the weaving room. I can see her now sitting in the weaving machine and hear her pedals going plop plop as she threaded them with her feet. She was a good weaver. I stayed around the Big House too, picking up chips, sweeping the yard and such. Miss Mary Jane was quick as a whip. She had black eyes that snapped, and they saw everything. She could turn her head so quickly that she'd catch you every time you tried to steal a lump of sugar. I liked Mars Frank better than I did Miss Mary Jane. All us little children called him Big Pappy. He went to Rayleigh about twice a year, and every time he came back, he brought us slaves some candy. Rayleigh was far away from the plantations, near about 60 miles. It always took Mars Frank three days to make the trip, a day to go, a day to stay in town, and a day to come back. He always got home at night, but when he rode horseback instead of the carriage, and then sometimes he got home by sundown. Mars Frank didn't go to the war. He was too old, so when the Yankees came through, they found him at home. When Mars Frank saw the blue coats coming down the road, he ran and got his gun. The Yankees were on horses. I had never seen so many men. They were thick as hornets coming down the road on a cloud of dust. They came up to the house and tied the horses all around the yard fence. When they saw Mars Frank standing on the porch with a gun leveled on them, they got mad. By the time Mars Frank shot one time, a bully Yankee snatched the gun away and told Mars Frank to hold up his hands. Then they tied his hands and pushed him down on the floor and told him that if he moved, they would shoot him. Then they went into the house. I was scared to death, but I ran in the kitchen and got a butcher knife. And when the Yankees weren't looking, I tried to cut the rope and set Mars Crank free. But one of them blue devils saw me and came running. He said, what are you doing, you black brat, you stinking little alligator bait? He snatched the knife from my hand and told me to stick out my tongue, that he was going to cut it off. I let out a yell and ran behind the house. Some of the Yankees were in the smokehouse getting the meat, some of them were at the stables getting the horses, and some of them in the house getting the silver and things. I saw them put the big silver pitcher and teapot in a bag. Then they took the knives and the forks and all the candlesticks and platers off the sideboard. They went into the parlor and got the gold clock that was Miss Mary Jane's grandmammy's. 
Then they got all the jewelry out of Miss Mary Jane's box. They went up to Miss Mary Jane and while she looked at them with her black eyes snapping, they took the rings off her fingers. Then they took her gold bracelet. They even took the ruby earrings out of her ears and the gold comb out of her hair. I quit peeping in the window and was standing outside the house when the Yankees came out in the yard with all the stuff they were totting off. Mars Frank was still sitting on the porch floor with his hands tied and couldn't do anything. About that time, I saw the beehives in the side yard. There was a whole line of hives. Little as I was, I had a notion. I ran and got a long stick and turned over every one of the hives. Then I stirred the bees up with that stick till they were so mad I could smell the poison. And bees, you have never seen the like of bees. They were swarming all over the place. They sailed into the Yankees like bullets, each one madder than the other. They hit on the horses till they looked like they were alive with barmits. The horses broke their bridles and tore down the fences and ran down the road. Yankees bust out cussing, but what did a bee care about the cuss words? They stuck poison stings on their blue coats. The Yankees forgot all about the meat and the things they stole. They took off down the road on a run, passing the horses. The bees were right after them in a long line. They'd zoom and zip and zoom and zip and every time they'd zip, a Yankee would yell. When they'd gone, Miss Mary Jane untied Mars Frank. Then they took all the silver, meat and the things Yankees left behind and buried it so if they came back, they couldn't find it. Then they called me and said, Ida, if you hadn't turned over the beehives, the Yankees would have looted off near about everything fine we got. We want to give you something you can keep so you will always remember this day and how you ran the Yankees away. Then Miss Mary Jane took a plain gold ring off her finger and put it on mine, and I have been wearing it ever since. So, Kristen and Josh, what are your initial thoughts about the story? Oh, there was a lot of thoughts from the story. Um, I did find it interesting how the slave girl had went out of her way to save the slave masters even though everything that they've done to her and you know her family and everything she didn't see the, the union soldiers as a sign of hope or someone coming to rescue them she saw them as the villain instead of of the slave masters and then also when they first got there and she was trying to to save them, I think like one of the Union soldiers had said something to her, like it was kind of like a derogatory term. And I thought that was weird just because, okay, they're coming to liberate the slaves, but yet you're still talking to them in like a derogatory manner. I agree a lot with what Josh said. I thought it was really interesting, but it also kind of pulls me in many different directions because of the timing that it took place and just everything that was going around that time, like it's very hard for me to kind of fathom a slave saving their owner who treats them like they're not human. I think it's a remarkable story though. I applaud Ida for everything that she did because- She was only eight. Really, <laughs> yeah, that speaks a lot to her character as an eight year old. That she had to learn and basically be an adult before she was really even born. So I applaud her strength and her courage to do what she did, but it is still kind of hard to fathom that concept of considering everything that's going on. Yes, we definitely need to applaud Ida for her bravery, courage, and character. And I also thought it was interesting that the Union soldiers were fighting the Civil War to end slavery, but she probably didn't know that. I'm sure access of any kind of outside information was restricted by the masters because information can unite people and in turn encourage rebellion by the slaves. Also, I don't think Civil War was just about abolishing slavery. And please correct me if I'm wrong because I didn't grow up here in the US or was taught US history in school. But even though the common explanation is that the Civil War was fought over the moral issue of slavery, it was the economics of slavery and political control of the system that was central to the conflict. I think the economy in North was moving towards industry and there was steady flow of European immigrants who could be hired as factory workers. Economy in South was based on agriculture that depended on enslaved people. The South wished to take the slavery into the Western territories while the North was committed to keeping them open to white labor alone and refusing to allow black people to move north if they desired. It was about control of federal government over states, and I'm sure the common people who were actually fighting were not fighting to keep or free the slaves, 
they were probably fighting to defend the Union or save the South. It was a conflict between two establishments, one that economically depended on slavery and another that did not. However, the bottom line is slavery was abolished after the Civil War. But have you all heard about or learned in school about the economic reasons of Civil War? In my personal experience in education, I haven't. What we've been taught in school is that the main motive for the war was to free the slaves. But I could see how they could actually have another motive, but then they saw like, oh, well, freeing the slaves would also benefit us too, so let's go ahead and try to make that a motive as well. Um, and I say that just because based on that story, like how uh, I said before, like when that soldier had spoken to Ida in a derogatory manner, that showed that, okay, he still saw himself as superior to black people. And so that made me think, okay, well, yeah, he's a Union soldier, but he still kind of has some animosity towards the black population. So it made me question, okay, does he really want them to be free or is he just doing it because that's what he's supposed to do? Um, so I, I can kind of see how freeing the slaves was a byproduct of it, but just at least in my education, we were taught that the main motive was primarily to free the slaves. Okay, but just like with stories, it is for history too, that who writes it and who controls the narrative, right? But whatever reason or reasons there may be, slavery was abolished and that's a great outcome. Now, coming back to the story, let's talk about Ida's bravery and her actions and her risking her life to save her masters. I think it was the psychological grooming she must have gotten growing up to be unconditionally submissive to her master and maybe subconsciously she feared some kind of consequence or punishment if she did not try to help. And even though she was just eight, she saw and learned the service and submission which was expected of her. I agree with that. I think that's something that's very toxic in a lot of master-slave relationships that we even see today. Like to put that in a more now perspective. Modern. Modern, <laughs> modern perspective. <laughs> put this in a more modern perspective. Thinking of people that are in abusive relationships or people that are in sex trafficking situations, they are trained in their mind that if they don't do what the person that is quote-unquote their master says, then there's going to be negative consequences that they have to face. So they have to risk their lives just to save the person that is actually abusing them. So it's interesting that you say that because that's something that we even see today. And to just think how that started, not really that long ago, but is still being used in harmful practices today. Right. I think that's a very good parallel or extrapolation to the same kind of relation, but in a different context. It is not just about the physical control, but also the control over mind and thoughts. Another thing which I noticed in the story was Ida's parents' names. They had the same last name as their master. Do you know if it was a common practice? Because it's like losing your legacy and your roots. I am not sure on anything, but I do feel like I've learned something that giving when the master gave the slave their last name it was kind of like a form of showing ownership so if something were to happen like if they were to run off or something and they knew that last name they could associate it with who their master was i'm not a hundred percent certain on this at all but i feel like i've heard something around that that also kind of goes back to people that live in Africa, they have, you'll come across African Americans sometimes that have two last names or they will talk about two last names because they have one that originated from their country or their tribe or wherever they're from, but then they also have this American name that was attached to them that they probably did not want. Again, I don't know for sure, but I've heard conversations centered around the last name of slaves. Do you think, is there any relation to some people having an English name in addition to their native name? For example, people from some Asian countries have an English name, or Native Americans, or people from India sometimes shorten their name to, I don't know, make it easy for English-speaking population? And maybe that's not the reason for everyone, but I don't think anyone in Europe changes their name, even though languages are still different. I don't think... It's a name that they choose, but more so, like you were saying, a name that they are given both 
during slavery in Africa, like people that would come into their countries, they would give them this other name instead of the name that they were born with. I know the example that you're talking about um, in some Asian families where they use names more associated with English, maybe, I don't know, but I think theirs wasn't, it's always been forced on them instead of them having the ability to choose it. Yeah, and I think a lot of that is still evident. So I'm originally from Louisiana, and I think a lot of that is evident in a lot of the uh, native Louisiana last names. Uh, a lot of the last names are very French. The majority of native Black Louisianas, a lot of our last names are French. And some of that may be from like a mixing of ancestry, but then some of that might also be evident of their actual last name being replaced with the last name of the slave master. And then it just, it stayed that way and no one actually knew any better and that last name stuck. And I, I can see how that can still be a thing. Cause even now, if, if like a black person who has a very French last name, like they give their last name to someone who's actually familiar with that last name, like you know, maybe someone from France, they're, they're pretty shocked. Like, oh, that's like a very rich last name. Uh, like for example, like my cousin's last name is Bourgeois and that's associated with a very wealthy class in France. And that doesn't usually include black people, but my cousins are black and have that last name. And now whether that's a product of slavery or a product of mixed ancestry, I'm not sure, but I'm willing to bet that that's still a case, in, at least in Louisiana. Yes, that explains the same last name and going to Kristen's point about forced name and a name you choose yourself. I agree, those are two very different things. So what do you think about the master in the story? Marsk Frank was considered to be good to his slaves, even though he starved his slaves, had them work on half rations, but just because he didn't beat them, he was a good master. That is such a low bar to be a good and decent human being. And extrapolating it to current times, Last year, we saw a big push for social justice with Black Lives Matter movement. And you must have seen on TV, on news, some cops were hugging people or crying and companies were changing their social media logos. All this is bare minimum to, I guess, make yourself look good. That is not real action or change, which is actually needed for equality. Yeah, I can definitely see the parallels there. Um... It, well, I guess first to, to talk on the story, the, the fact that he was the, one of the nicer slave masters and just because of the fact that he didn't beat the slaves and that just speaks to how often, how common it was for slaves to get some kind of physical punishment, whether that was beatings or getting certain limbs chopped off or your tongue cut off or things like that. And so the fact that he did not none of that, it, it's sad to say, but yeah, he was one of the nicer ones. And then even today, you know, I can... I can see it today <laughs> in a lot of people in, in the country, especially now that like a lot of the social justice stuff has really been brought to a lot of people's attention um, due to you know even the pandemic and stuff. People are kind of forced to see it now and they're starting to realize uh, that this is actually a problem. Like some people really did not know that this was. They claim that they that they did not know that this is still an issue. You know, back when a lot of the protests were going on, I would have people come up to me, and I'm not gonna say people. I've had white people come up to me and ask me like, oh well, how can I? talk to my kids about racism. Like, I really want to talk to them about racism. How can I do that? And it's kind of like, okay, you're making that effort, but then it's also, okay, th the internet is an amazing place. It would be even more meaningful if you took that extra step to even educate yourself first, and then, you know, maybe ask for clarification on what, on what you found on, on your own, instead of just going out to someone and just saying, hey, you know, teach me about this. And then from their perspective, they see that as, oh, okay, I'm trying to, you know, dismantle racism, trying to do this, trying to do that. Uh, but then it just stops there. You know, they ask the question, then like, even if you give them advice, they, they won't do it. They're just like, okay, well, I addressed it. That shows that I care. That's all that I need to do. Like, you're not actually out there in the world trying to produce change, trying to change the system, trying to produce long lasting change, change that will affect generation after generation. Uh, you're just more in it for just the short term benefits and just, you know, trying to make yourself look good. That is putting burden back on the oppressed to again do the work so we can feel better about ourselves. I guess at this point we can talk about Juneteenth. Like I said before, I didn't grow up in the US and did not know about Juneteenth. So I think a brief summary of what Juneteenth is will benefit me and our listeners. Juneteenth, short for June 19th, marks the day when federal troops arrived in Galveston, Texas in 1865. 
to take control of the state and ensure all enslaved people be freed. The troops arrival came a full two and a half years after the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, so Juneteenth commemorates the effective end of slavery in the United States. The Emancipation Proclamation issued by President Abraham Lincoln on January 1, 1863 had established that all enslaved people in Confederate states in rebellion against the Union shall be free. But in reality, the Emancipation Proclamation didn't instantly free any enslaved people. In Texas, slavery had continued as the state experienced no large-scale fighting or significant presence of Union troops. Many enslavers from outside Texas had moved there as they viewed it as a safe haven for slavery. After the war came to a close in the spring of 1865, General Granger's arrival to Galveston that June signaled freedom for Texas's slaves. Although emancipation didn't happen overnight for everyone, in some cases, enslavers withheld the information until after the harvest season. So milking that last bit of slavery, celebrations broke out among newly freed black people, and Juneteenth was born. That December, slavery in America was formally abolished with the adoption of the 13th Amendment. So what does Juneteenth mean to you both? Do you all celebrate it or have any traditions attached to it? So I was born and raised in the U.S. and Juneteenth was never even discussed. And maybe it was discussed in like a sentence of a history book, but I did not <laughs> know much to anything about Juneteenth. I did learn about it. I'm a little bit as I got older and what really made the information stick the most was really when I watched the episode of Juneteenth on Black. Black (laughs) (laughs) Blackish did a very good job highlighting what Juneteenth was. And then last summer, I actually did a presentation about having race-based conversations in the workplace. And it just so happened my presentation was on Juneteenth. So I had to do a little bit more research to learn what it was to explain to adults what Juneteenth was. So I say all that to say, it's hard for me to develop. I have a very strong appreciation for it, but the way that the 4th of July is so ingrained and like celebrated once like being in America, it's it's not hard to kind of not celebrate Juneteenth, but it's like, why weren't we celebrating this the same way that we celebrate the 4th of July. And the Juneteenth is actually an even more of a struggle than the 4th of July was because half of the slaves in the country were free and the other halves weren't. So it was the slaves in Texas were like the last to be freed. And even then when they were freed, it still took two years later for them to actually be considered citizens of the United States. So it's just so like, it's. It makes you feel good, but it's also just not the biggest smile on your face. Like, we Black people have struggled so much in this country since day one. And it's still like, we still have to make ongoing progress to even get to halfway of where white people are in this country. So I love, now that I know about it more, I love to actually do things and celebrate it with other Black people or just people more honestly black people (laughs) but yeah juneteenth is a weird mixed feeling for me because it's like i should have been celebrating this the same way i celebrated fourth of july and i have to educate myself and play catch up to understand what juneteenth even is yeah i totally agree with that um even in in my upbringing i was never taught about it at all i think the only thing that i saw is you know when i was a kid i would look at the calendar and see when all you know all the different holidays would happen and i noticed that juneteenth was on there i just didn't know what it was i was like oh that's interesting that's like when they put like boxing day on i'm like i don't know what that is but you know but it's on the calendar and it was interesting you know going to you know elementary middle and high school in texas and texas being the last state where the slaves were freed we were never taught about that at all in our history classes or social studies um and even in seventh grade we have to take a class called texas history and in that entire class juneteenth was not mentioned once uh and that's that just speaks to like the whitewashing of history you know they teach us the parts of history that they want us to know and they leave out certain parts and then as Kristen was saying like as we became adults and got older that's when we had to educate ourselves about our own history and try to gain our 
or even more of an appreciation for our background, our culture, um, being proud of being black, just because it's been trying to, there were strong attempts to have it whitewashed and overpowered as we were growing up as kids. And because of that, to be honest, is not, I, like, I definitely appreciate the holiday and everything that it means, but because of the way that I was brought up, is not that major of a holiday for me right now because I'm just now learning about what it is and really having an appreciation for it after I'm 25. And I've, I've really only known what Juneteenth was maybe within the last few years. Uh, and that's, that's a big difference, you know, when you've been celebrating Independence Day since you were born and then really appreciating Juneteenth within the last few years. And so I don't personally have any traditions, but as Kristen said, like I'm trying to do more with Black people now uh, to celebrate the holiday and to have a, a greater appreciation for the holiday. I think it's, <laughs> I have mixed feelings about them trying to make it a, like a national holiday. Like it's, it's, it's good. I'm glad that they're recognizing it, but then I also wonder if it's from a sincere place. Mm -hmm. Like, are they just doing it because, okay, now more black people are now learning about it and now mm -hmm. we're speaking up about it. They're making episodes about it, like blackish, you know, it's kind of being, thrown in everyone's face now and now it's kind of putting them on the spotlight and it's like hey are you going to make it a holiday or not because now we know what it is other people know what it is what's up and you know now i feel like now you know companies are giving their, their employees days off and things like that just because like oh okay the black people have learned now and now they're making an uproar about it let's do something to make ourselves look good and so you know i'm, I'm glad that it's happening but i also wonder if it's from a place of sincerity yeah and even with that are you giving me the day off, like you said, because you're going to use this day to educate yourself on what Juneteenth was? Like, we have a whole, like, 4th of July is so big. Everybody talk, does all these big special things for 4th of July, getting their American flags, red, white, and blue, all day, every day. And it's like, okay, but you're going to give me this day off. Are you still going to have that much pride and be happy that slaves were free finally or are you just giving me this day off because you realize that it's a holiday that actually needs to be celebrated and it's really like i should not feel this way as a black person about juneteenth like is i don't have a negative way about it i have a negative way of why it wasn't taught now that i think about it i remember my family we would always joke like happy fourth of july black people weren't free then like that would that would always be the follow up <laughs> phrase after that, but it never really registered, and I wasn't fully taught about Juneteenth. I think that is definitely a failure of education system, and it's so crazy that Texas, where Juneteenth started, and it was the first state to make it a holiday, but did not include it in school curriculum. And probably now they are teaching it in schools, but this happened in 1865. So it shouldn't have taken this long to be in history books. And as you said, is it because of the social push or you really want to tell the history? Another example of whitewashing history. And going to Josh's point about people trying to make it a national holiday, I totally agree with that. And quoting Emma Lazarus, until we all are free, none of us are free. And I will make a very controversial statement here about replacing 4th of July with Juneteenth. Not every American got their independence on 4th of July, but every American got freedom on Juneteenth. So that is just about equality and if everyone's freedom is valued equally. But I get how ingrained 4th of July is in Americans. It is part of their Americanness. And I understand the pride and emotion attached to it because India was colonized by British. And so on our Independence Day, which is August 15, I get that patriotic feeling, the pride and emotion when I think about the struggle of our freedom fighters. Although it is not comparable because India was actually fighting against its colonizers. And in the US, white people were just fighting amongst each other. Anyway, it is just my observation as an outsider that it is not fair. Also, I will add that I also watched the Blackish episode you were talking about and that Blackish does a good job in educating and bringing awareness to a lot of racial topics. So talking of Juneteenth, slavery in America was formally abolished with the adoption of the 13th Amendment. 13th Amendment says, quote, neither slavery or involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States, 
or any place subject to its jurisdiction, end quote. So here are two points. First, that the slavery is abolished except if you're convicted of a crime. And second, that this amendment is in the U.S., but also any place subject to their jurisdiction. This line is so telling of the colonizer mindset that even after getting their own independence, they are still thinking about places under their jurisdiction. But going back to the loophole which still permits slavery in prison system, do you think is there a link between the exception clause and the rise of prison system which incarcerates black people at a higher rate than white people and profits off of their unpaid or underpaid labor? 13th Amendment is um, interesting. Yes, I do think, and I know for a fact, that prisons are like the biggest form of enslavement that we practice in the U.S., but then we also have sex trafficking, which is another form of enslavement. And there is also a really good documentary on Netflix called The 13th that specifically talks about the 13th commitment oh gosh, the 13th <laughs> Amendment and its connection to prisons. That is very insightful and really helped me a lot with understanding. But the 13th Amendment in general, it abolished slavery, great, but there's still so many other caveats that were not connected with that abolishment, like the right to still roam around in the United States and not be discriminated against because of your race and just other forms of racial injustice. So yeah, the 13th Amendment abolished slavery, but it didn't abolish the way that Black people were still treated in this country. And it's just still like the basic liberties which is a whole nother discussion because liberties branches off into a whole bunch of other things. But just the basic right to be treated as a human and treated as an equal was not attached to that abolishment. So, yay, we got rid of slavery, but one, we didn't. And two, we didn't incorporate the other liberties that the other white Americans were getting with that abolishment. Yeah, I think the true equality, with however much progress we have made, will still take a long time. And I think that raising awareness is great, but actual actions are required to make any real change. And that's not just for racism, but any kind of oppression. We can work towards making the education system teaching the real and complete history and push government to recognize the imbalance in society and come up with action steps so the subsequent generation in the U.S. can be better educated than people now are to the cultural history around Juneteenth and racism in general and the value that it contributes to understanding American freedom today. And at this point, I want to thank you, Kristen and Josh, for coming on the show and sharing your thoughts. Do you all have any parting thoughts? And please tell if you have any special plans for Juneteenth. Well, first, thank you for having us on here and for having this story being told i think what you're doing is it's exactly what we have been preaching for the past year of this is a topic that we don't get a lot of education about that surrounds an oppressed group of people i'm gonna go out and i'm going to research it i'm going to educate myself on this topic and how i can have a better understanding, especially from somebody that wasn't born here, having a better understanding of where we are in America, which is far, but it's not that far. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I really appreciate this. Um, I enjoyed it. And for Juneteenth, Josh and I will be at a pride party. So, <laughs> but we're celebrating it on all ends. You know, we celebrating everybody, but... <laughs> I have fun. Yes. Thank you so much for just having this discussion. And these are discussions that need to be had. So I applaud you for that. And I'm, this is no, nothing against you, but like the fact that like that has to be applauded says a lot about what, what's happening in the country. You know, no one wants to talk about it. No one thinks it needs to be talked about. And then when people do talk about it, it's like, yes, thank you. Like, finally. And then also, thank you for seeking out the, the perspectives of Black people. Because I, I have seen that, you know, some non-Black people, when they want to really dive down deep into these kinds of topics, they are 
too scared or too shy to seek out the perspective of a black person. They'll ask someone who's not black, and it's like, well, they, I mean, you know, they might be knowledgeable, but they can't truly give it to you like how we could because this is, this is our life. <laughs> um, so thank you for that. Um, definitely enjoyed this discussion. Uh, I don't know about Krista, but I, I, I had to hold back on some things so that, you know, the discussion didn't go too long, but this is something that I could definitely talk about longer. Oh yeah, I definitely <laughs> But I, I know we were on the time limit, so I, I digress. <laughs> I think it was a great discussion and thank you again for coming. And are you on any social media in case our listeners want to check who the guests were? I'm not one of those followers that's funny. So if you follow me, <laughs> you won't be really entertained. Uh, if you like, <laughs> I mean, I'm not one of those influencers either. Um, every now and then I'll post like some educational stuff regarding race, equality, things like that, just because I'm very much involved with that in my work. I just do it from a behavior analytic perspective. My name is, well, my Instagram name is at the brown sir. Um, I know it's, it's an, an interesting name. There's a story behind that, but that's the name, uh, the brown sir. It was great to have you both. And thank you everyone for listening. This Juneteenth, I will be watching 13th on Netflix. And to everyone listening in the U.S., hopefully y'all will educate yourself and take the same pride in Juneteenth as you do in 4th of July and work towards the same level of community celebration. I will see you next week with a new story and new themes. Bye for now. Let me know your thoughts on the story and our discussion by emailing me on woketalespodcast at gmail.com or through social media at woketalespodcast on Instagram and woketalespod on Twitter. And please rate, review, and like Woke Tales Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe so you can easily access our weekly stories. If you have any story recommendations or if you want to come dissect and analyze a story with me, give me a shout out on email or social media. Because whatever you do, keep dissecting and keep analyzing. <laughs> <laughs>